Hello, my name is John McCarr. I'm a senior research officer with the National Research Council of Canada. I'm going to be talking to you today about recent research results from a project that investigates the interactions between pyrite, pyrotite and steel and their implications for concrete durability. This work was carried out with my colleagues Nafisa Ibrahimi and Amin Ghazi Askar. I'm going to give you some background on why this project was carried out, describe the experimental procedure, present some of the results from the work, and then give conclusions based on those results. It's important to bear in mind as we go through the presentation that this is a bench study and it is not yet clear whether the results actually apply to concrete in the field. That's work that still remains to be done. There have been major incidents of concrete damage due to the presence of pyrotite in both Canada and the United States. In Quebec, there have been over $400 million in damage. Over a thousand buildings have been affected and the final total is in no way yet clear. The problem can be 10 times worse in the United States. Damage appears over years, not immediately. And when it does occur, it often ends up looking similar to the image in the slide. You can see that there's a large crack that started at the edge, which is out of the picture at the corner of the building, propagated more or less across the building, but then additional cracks also formed, some of them again propagating across the building, but others in transverse directions. So you end up with a form of map cracking, although the details are different than other forms of concrete damage. Unlike European standards, the Canadian Concrete Standard, CSA 823.1.2, and the ASTM standard for concrete allow up to 1% sulfur content in the concrete aggregate. Um, there's no restrictions based on whether or not pyrotite is present. As a result, pyrotite damage can happen and has happened. Currently in the standard, there is a performance-based test for pyrotite reactivity, which was developed by some of the people working on the overall project I'm about to describe, but um, it's only included for informational purposes at this point. It's not a mandatory test standard. So I'm one of the technical leads for a $4.9 million research project which is underway to support the development of a mandatory standard in Canada for pyrotite testing, uh, improve understanding of the damage mechanisms by which pyrotite causes damage in concrete, and map areas of risk in Canada. I'm not going to go into detail on the chemical processes related to pyrotite caused damage in concrete. Those can be found in some of the references in the written paper. I do want to give a little bit of background on them, in particular on the areas that are important for the work that's shown here. The process kicks off with oxygen and water vapor either diffusing into the concrete or being present in the concrete due to the casting process and, and the water added at that time. They react with pyrotite to form iron hydroxide and sulfuric acid. The iron hydroxide is a type of corrosion product. Subsequently, ettringite and thomasite form often years later. The iron hydroxide, the ettringite and thomasite all require more volume than their precursors. And as a result, the concrete ends up having to expand and then form cracks such as the ones seen in the image on the slide. One of the issues with this process is that pyrite and other sulfides and other metallic ores are often found with pyrotite. Pyrite is particularly common with it and so the question we wanted to address here was will pyrite accelerate the initial corrosion reactions? They're the limiting factors for this whole process and so the pyrite might make the corrosion happen more quickly or it might cause the corrosion to be problematic in the first place without um, 
and without it, it wouldn't be as, as significant an issue. Sample preparation followed basic electrochemical principles. 1.2 centimeter diameter cores of pyrite and pyrotite were cut from mineralogical samples. Um, similar diameter uh, cylinders were produced from smooth reinforcing steel. They were given electric connections and coated with epoxy with a different type of epoxy being used for the steel samples based on the type of connection we needed to make with it. The front surface of each sample type had the coating removed to produce a constant surface area for the experiments so that we could calculate current flows on a amp per centimeter squared basis if necessary and then the steel samples are pre-passivated in order to duplicate the conditions in concrete. Corrosion measurements followed ASTM G71. You can see a schematic of the experimental setup on the slide. A mineral and steel samples were placed in a bath. They were connected together through an ammeter and a switch and with a voltmeter set up to measure the voltage when the samples were connected. A um, reference electrode was also placed in there for the purpose of measuring the voltage. In the schematic you can see that we have a salt bath to improve the conductivity so the circuit was connected through the salt bath but we had different solutions in terms of pH so we use an acidic, a neutral and a simulated concrete pore solution and that was because Given that the pyrotite corrosion process produces sulfuric acid, it's not entirely clear where the pH in an active system would lie, whether the acidic would, uh, sulfuric acid would predominate or the poor solution. Similar results were seen in all cases. Uh, we're going to show the results from the um, simulated poor solution. So the corrosion potential was measured before and after the switch was closed to couple the samples together. Then the galvanic corrosion current and the galvanic corrosion potential was monitored for a long period of time after coupling. And we also measured the corrosion potential in an open circuit against a reference electrode. And those are actually the examples we're going to show first. So those open circuit potential measurements showed that there is a significant difference in potential between the pyrite in particular and the other two materials. Pyrotite and carbon steel had similar open circuit potentials and less than a 0.1 of a volt difference after 30 minutes of time. You can see that each of these curves flattens out over time and they approach a constant value. Generally speaking, a value of less than 0.1 volt difference usually means that you're not very likely to get corrosion reactions between two different materials. However, the pyrite had quite a large difference between both itself and the other two materials. And so these results suggested that there's a possibility of galvanic corrosion reactions between them. to start by looking at the coupling of pyrite and carbon steel. We did look at the coupling of pyrotite and carbon steel but as expected from the open circuit potential results there was not a, a large amount of galvanic um, corrosion activity taking place. In this case though you can see that on the top graph that the voltage between the two the steel and the mineral samples starts in positive value close to the value for pyrite and then gradually drops over time towards the value for steel. And the bottom graph you can see that the current starts off at uh, a fairly low level but is still present, drops, reaches a minimum, increases again and then reaches a constant value uh, towards the end of the experimental period. Um, so it's still present, it doesn't disappear, that suggests continuing corrosion. And the other thing that's interesting about the current uh, graph at the bottom is the sharp 
spikes in the current flow which are related to the breaking down of the passive layer on the steel. So those are both evidence for some significant corrosion activity and indeed when we took the samples out of the bath after the completion of the experiment we could see corrosion products on the surface of the steel sample. The largest currents measured during the project were seen in the case of the coupling of pyrite and pyrotite. You can see here that the um, voltages have been reversed in this case, so they're starting negative and going positive. That's because of a reversal in the experimental setup. Um, but there's a very rapid drop after the samples are coupled, and then it decreases a little bit and then falls a pattern of pretty much continuous increase, reaching a near constant level by the time we get close to the end of the experiment. And again, we're going from pyrite to pyrotype in terms of the voltage levels. The currents themselves are larger. They're pretty much continuous drop in current value over the course of the experiment, but it's leveled out by the time we get to the end. And we're still getting a pretty significant current uh, from the galvanic corrosion process at this point. Um, so that is both a indication of the uh, continued corrosion activity, but also a good indication that this is a potentially important phenomena. And you can see in the paper that um, the pyrotite is more damaged than the pyrite by this corrosion process. To conclude, we can see that the pyrite accelerated the oxidation of both pyrotite and reinforcing steel in a simulated concrete pore solution. This also occurred in neutral and acidic solutions. So as a result, it is possible that pyrite accelerates pyrotite caused damage in concrete. It is possible that pyrite accelerates the corrosion of reinforcing steel in concrete. This is, of course, a bench study, so research is currently underway to determine if these effects actually occur in concrete and both on the laboratory and in the field. I'd like to finish with some acknowledgements. Funding for this project was provided by the National Research Council of Canada and the Régie du Batement du Quebec. The project team itself is quite large and involves people working on the experimental part of the project but also other aspects such as the mapping work. The experimental team includes colleagues from NRC but also from the University of Laval and Ryerson University. The University of Laval and Ryerson University workers were responsible for the development of the test protocol that's currently present in the CSA concrete standard for informational purposes and have been particularly important in continuing to develop that line of research. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions.